it's Ming Canada here. You are listening to the Trips and Global on Wheels Podcast Hour, the place to be to learn about the latest and greatest life stories from people who are doing incredible disability advocacy work. Judy Woodruff, welcome to the Trips and Global on Wheels Podcast Hour. I'm glad to join you. Judy Woodruff is the anchor and managing ed- editor of the PBS News Hour. She has covered politics and other news for more than five decades at NBC, CNN, and PBS. So we invited you on our podcast show today because, of course, you are also a parent of a child with a disability. Your son, Jeffrey Woodruff Hunt, um, was born with spina bifida. So I understand you went to school at Meredith College in Raleigh, North Carolina, and later transferred to Duke University, majoring in political science two years later. So as you know, you and other journalists, such as Anderson Cooper, um, have shown that you don't necessarily have to major in journalism in order to have a successful career in this field. And so how were you able to thrive in a field that you had no formal education training in? And uh, can people today in this age of lightning, speed breaking news and social media still thrive in this field without having majoring in journalism? Well, let me take it a piece at a time. You're absolutely right. I didn't major in journalism. I didn't know I was gonna go into journalism when I started in college. In fact, my major was math. Frankly, I found that professors didn't think women should be taking advanced math. And eventually I found my way to political science. I had a great political science professor who got me very excited about politics and government, Uh, worked in Washington for a couple of summers for a member of Congress from Georgia, where my family was living then. I had grown up as a military brat, an army brat, lived all over the world um, as a little girl growing up, Germany, Taiwan, all over the United States. Um, But then in college, um, transferred uh, from Meredith to Duke, uh, changed my major to political science, Um, and really thought I would work in Washington. But then I got advice that women, this was the late 1960s, that women really shouldn't, um, uh, you know, try to go into government and politics because they wouldn't be given any kind of serious job. It was kind of the same advice I had, or message I had received studying math. But fortunately, I, I had a professor at Duke who said to me, well, did you ever think about covering politics? So at that point, I decided, okay, I'll look into journalism uh, and specifically TV journalism because I hadn't written for the school newspaper or anything. And in order to get a job as a reporter, you had to have have some clips, what we call clips, examples of your writing. I didn't have that. So I applied for a job at the very entry level as a secretary in the newsroom and was hired as a as a uh, as literally the newsroom secretary cleaning the film answering the phone writing letters for the news director at the abc affiliate in atlanta and um, i did that for a year and a half i kept bothering the news director asking him if i could um, hang out with the camera crew with the reporters to learn about what it's like to cover the news and he kept saying why would you want to do that we already have a woman reporter Uh, which was of course true and back then there was kind of a quota i mean there were either no women or maybe there was one woman um but i i did persevere i was hired by another station uh, in atlanta to cover the georgia state legislature and uh and that was really uh, uh, an amazing opportunity for me i felt like i died and gone to heaven because here i was a year and a half out of college and i was covering a real politics and frankly learning from the ground up because what I studied in college didn't bear a lot of resemblance to what I was doing, um, covering uh, Georgia state legislators from all over the state, something like 200 and some odd of them from all corners, rural and urban. But to get to your question about journalism, um, I, I really learned on the job. I learned, uh, in fact, there was a camera uh, man. Um, we, we now call them videographers, but we then call them cameramen. And he taught me not only how to hold a microphone and how to stand there and look into the lens and report, but he introduced me to the key people uh, at the state capitol in, in Atlanta and in Georgia. And I met 
a number of people. In fact, that year I covered the Jimmy Carter campaign for governor of Georgia. This was 1970. And I learned so much from Leroy Powell was his name. Um, and then of course, I just, you know, I just by osmosis, I was asking questions. I've always had a lot of curiosity and everybody I could learn from, I tried to learn from. I think today, Ming, it's different because um, there is a lot about journalism, about journalism law that it's probably good to know about, but I still don't think it's necessary to major in journalism. I think, in fact, I recommend to young people that they major in whatever subject they're interested in, whether it's English, literature, history, uh, economics, philosophy, um, you know, whatever subject really interests them. And then if they can take a course on the side in journalism or get a job as a journalist in the summer or on the weekends, and then perhaps go to graduate school if they're able to do that. Um, but, but I don't think you have to major. In fact, I don't recommend it. I think, I think there are wonderful journalism schools and they do a great job, but I think it's important to um, I think it's important to know a lot about the world, especially if you want to be a reporter. And you're going to need to know something about history, a lot about history. You're going to need to keep on learning your whole life, which is what I've learned. You, you know, you really never, ever stop learning. You come out of school, but there's still so much you don't know. And you need to be humble about that. So uh, I don't think it's a mistake to major in journalism. I just generally recommend that people study whatever they're most interested in, and then uh, find a way to, to, uh, to work, out as, work as a journalist. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that. My next question is more on people with disabilities who want to go into journalism. So what are, what's your advice for them, especially since a lot of people who have physical disabilities, they don't fit into that mold of what you see on TV, especially mainstream media. Well, I don't, I, I know that in general, because I'm the mother of a son with disabilities, Jeffrey, I know that in general, everything is harder um, for those with different, different abilities. Uh, the world is not a friendly place. It's not a place um, in, in too many places that makes the kind of accommodations that they need to make, whether it's learning differences or physical, uh, physical differences. Um, or um, uh, other, other kinds of differences that may exist. And so young people with disabilities have to think hard about, you know, how am I gonna do this? And who can help me? Who can I learn from? Uh, where's a place where I could work and learn uh, that would be supportive? And I think we still have a lot of progress to make in that direction. I think. Um, my son turned out was not interested uh, in going into journalism. He was very interested in science. Jeffrey was born with spina bifida, you're right. Um, but as a teenager, he had a surgery that left him uh, significantly physically disabled. He was not uh, significantly disabled before that. So his life changed quite dramatically when he was 16 years old. And he, ha he went from being somebody who was interested in, had done a num number of internships at the Food and Drug Administration, at the, uh, at the Centers for Disease Control, at the National Institutes of Health, somebody who was interested in studying uh, infectious diseases, which is such a coincidence right now, uh, to somebody whose options were more limited. And um, I, I think knowing and seeing what Jeff has experienced, I would say it's really important to find a mentor, to find someone in the field who knows that field very well and can think with you about what direction you wanna go in. How do you wanna apply your interest and skills in journalism? I think writing is clearly something you can do. There's so many ways to write on the computer. You can write uh, you know, with, with accommodation. And it's a matter of having the opportunity to do that, having guidance, having feedback, having people who take a real interest in your situation, who um, will give you good advice and good counsel as you think about how to do it. But um, we, we need more journalists um, with disabilities. We need, 
I like to say that in journalism, we need to look like the whole country. We need to, you know, be gender balanced and we need to be balanced in terms of, of uh, our ethnic and racial background and our and the places that we've lived. And we don't all need to come from Northeastern United States and have gone to Ivy League schools. We need to be Americans of all different backgrounds and people who've traveled and, and know the country and know the world and have a lot of interest. And so um, having, having journalists with disabilities, I think makes, it, makes journalism better, it makes it stronger. And I think it's really important for young people who want to go into journalism who happen to have disabilities to have mentors and, and bosses, uh, people who will be sure to take their interests into consideration. I think that's just essential. I really do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, great insight. So as we were saying earlier, and as you um, shared with us as well, um, Jeffrey was born with sp spina bifida, which you didn't find out until your eighth month of pregnancy. Um, That's right. So for people who don't know, spina bifida is a condition in which the spinal column is not fully formed at birth. And children with spina bifida also have hydrocephalus, which means they make more cerebrospinal fluid than they absorb, which is also the case with Jeffrey. Um, yeah, mo in most cases, that's right. Yeah, and uh, and it it was a very mild form when he was born, but then a surgery he had when he was sixteen, which you were saying um, caused him to be severely disabled. So, in a couple of articles that you were interviewed in, you said that um, we just leapt o leapt over the grieving process and jumped ahead to how we were going to make the best of it. it. And then you also added, it's important to acknowledge the sadness and the loss. Can you please tell us, um, explain to us why it's so crucial to acknowledge the sadness and the loss and what were the consequences of not allowing for that process? Well, I mean, every situation is different. Obviously, some individuals are born with um, significant physical or other kinds of disabilities. And um, those are circumstances they live with their entire lives. Other, others may have something occur as they grow up, either as a child or in Jeffrey's case as a teenager or even as an adult, um, that have the effect of changing their life, changing their, their future, their ability to contribute as as uh, men, women, um, members of, of, uh, of society. Uh, it, it can change their trajectory in terms of employment, in terms of engagement with, with other people. And that's been the case with Jeff. As I mentioned, he would have, he would have studied science, I'm sure, if, if, uh, if the course, at least that was what he wanted to do before he was injured when he was 16. I think I think for us, because it was such a profound um, uh, thing that happened with Jeff, that he really, he was the same person on the inside, but his ability to do what he had wanted to do. He could no longer walk with assistance. He could no longer, his speech was impaired. He couldn't use, he could use only one of his uh, arms, one of his hands easily. And even then, uh, fine motor, activities were very limited. Um, his vision was impaired. He couldn't, one eye was permanently closed as a result. Um, the other eye could only look in certain directions. Um, I mentioned the speech and, and significantly Ming, his short-term memory was, uh, was sharply uh, affected by this. Uh, Jeff, can remember very well things that happened to him as a child, but he may have a hard time remembering what somebody said to him a minute or two ago. Uh, the short term, the human memory is a really remarkable thing, how it works. Um, at the same time, he remembers so much and he knows so much. He's very bright. I, we talk to him every day. He doesn't live with us now, but we are in constant contact with him. And especially since the uh, onset of the coronavirus pandemic, um, because we're all trying to stay safe, 
and we talk to him a lot. Fortunately, he's in a place where he's being very well cared for, is being kept safe, and we're keeping him safe by not trying to, you know, visit him in person um, as much as we want to. Um, but he he changed uh, his his ability to to do what he wanted to do changed, and his his future changed as a result of what happened. And that was a loss. You could say it was also a gain in that it opened our eyes to many things that we didn't think about before. But I do think it's the reason I say it's important to acknowledge the loss is because otherwise you are not dealing with the, the whole picture, the whole story. Um, the possibility that existed for Jeffrey Hunt uh, as a young teenager for the rest of his life just wasn't there anymore. And um, the fact that he lost the ability to do important, important things wasn't there anymore. And for me as his mother, you know, I'd known him for 16 years. It was a big loss. It was a, a loss for our family, for his siblings, his younger siblings, of course, for my husband, for all of our family members, loved ones, anybody who knew Jeff. Um, it, and I think we tried very hard in the beginning to sort of power through that. Both my husband and I are kind of type A people. We like to, you know, to sort of take charge of the situation and say, we're going to fix this. We're going to make it work. We're going to make the best of this. And we did try to do that. And I think that in many ways that was good for Jeff because we were able to find therapists who were very helpful to him and to help him realize the maximum extent of his physical and intellectual and, and cognitive abilities. Um, but at the same time, um, we, we left the grieving process sort of by the wayside. We had to come back to that later on. I think it was important for our healing process as a family, for his siblings, um, uh, for all of us. It's just natural. I think you have to take honest stock of what's happened in your own life and in the life of your family in order to stay healthy um, uh, from a, just a, an emotional standpoint and a social standpoint. I mean, you can't just pretend that nothing happened, something big happened. And so that was really important for us. But I say that it's, it's good for him as well because we did, I think we've helped Jeffrey to be in a position where he can try to um, make the most of his life as it is. And he's certainly done that. He, lives in a supportive community not too far from Washington, D.C., where we live. Uh, it's a program run by a college. He works at the college, uh, has a job there four days a week under normal circumstances. Right now, it's not normal. A lot of things have shut down at the college during this pandemic, but he normally works there several hours a day, um, and he participates in a lot of activities. Circumscribed, he can't do everything, but he can do a lot and he realizes that. And Jeffrey's very social, he's a very people person, uh, much a people person. He likes to be with people, he loves to interact with people. And so that's a very big part of his life. And it's one of the reasons uh, the, the program where he lives has been so good for him. And it's been good for us as a family because we can be there for him when we need to be, but, but living with us would not be, I don't think, anywhere near the fun. <laughs> being where he is. Mm -hmm. And he gets the independence and freedom as well. But what are some creative ways you and Al have tried to adapt family activities, trips to include Jeffrey as much as possible? Activities he could do at 16 and prior is different mm -hmm. than 16 and after. Well, it's, in it's so interesting you should say that because in the beginning we tried not to change anything. We just thought we're going to barrel through, we're going to take him on trip. We that when Jeff was injured, we were still in a pattern of traveling internationally every year. We would take a trip in the U.S. and then we would go overseas. Um, and the year after Jeff was injured, he was 16, he was 17 years old, we took him on a cruise, um, uh, I think from the United States to Bermuda. We had never done a cruise before and we thought we'll experiment and see what that's like. Actually, no, we had done it once before. And it turned out to be a very good experience. It's interesting now because cruises have become um, questionable given, given the spread of the, of the coronavirus and other, other uh, contagious diseases. But back in 1998, 
um, that was a great option. And, and we ended up doing a couple of other cruises over the years with Jeff because we found the ships are quite um, uh, uh, convenient for people with, in wheelchairs. Jeff's in a wheelchair um, because they have elevators, there are activities, everything is level. You don't have to go use stairs for anything. There's always a way to get from one place to another. And, and there's no door that's too narrow. We put Jeff in rooms that were ADA uh, certified so the doorways were wide enough for him and so forth. We also have, um, uh, over the years, we've, we've been able to hire someone to go with us on the trip to help me take care of Jeff because he does need uh, help with activities of daily living. Um, and so that's been helpful as well. But I started to say in the very beginning, we took one trip to Spain and Morocco. This was before um, uh, we thought about cruises very much. And we ended up um, uh, doing, a, we were basically carrying Jeffrey places and lifting him here and there. And um, we went to the, um, the, the Medina in Fez, Morocco, which is this very, very crowded, um, un disorganized market where the, the walkways are very uneven and you frankly can't, and cobblestones, and you just can't do it in a wheelchair. So I ended up, I remember at one point, sending the rest of the family through the Medina and I stayed in the hotel with Jeff because we couldn't go. Um, but there was another trip. We took a trip, uh, we were in Russia in St. Petersburg and we wanted to see these old cathedrals and museums and some of them had a lot of stairs and my husband ended up carrying Jeff. I mean, his siblings and I carried the wheelchair up and Al ended up carrying Jeff up the stairs or helping him part of the way and then helping him walk. He can walk to, a, to an extent with help. And that's what he does today. But we did have to be creative. We had to think about that. And I would say today, it's harder for us to lift him. He's still a pretty slim guy. So it's not that he's so heavy for us. But as we get older, we don't want to take any chances. We certainly don't want to drop him. We don't want to have him have any issues and so we think hard about either we have help or we go places where there are clearly going to be supports that we can use to get Jeff from one place to another so we have to think ahead um, very carefully for example we've always I've said as a family I would love to take our family on a photographic safari in Africa to see the animals it's something Jeffrey would love to do but we clearly can't do that unless we plan ahead have everything worked out know that we can, we're going to have the supports that we need to get him in and out of the vehicles and into the hotel or whatever kind of overnight sleeping arrangements there are. Uh, I haven't ruled it out. I'm still, you know, still thinking we can do that. But it does require a lot of planning, even in the United States, traveling. Uh, there's, as you know very well, there are restaurants you can't go into. Uh, you have to book a room, a hotel room that's ADA uh, approved, accessible. And a lot of hotels only have a limited number of those rooms and they're booked up in advance. Um, one of the thing I'll mention is that Jeff loved to ski before he was injured. He still loves to ski. And what we do is we go to Colorado to Vail and we use, we take advantage of their wonderful adaptive ski program. So Jeff goes out and uses an adaptive ski, a sit ski. He has an instructor or two instructors and they go down the mountain even faster than I do. They put him on the chairlift, he goes up, he does a lot of runs. Uh, he's a great, still a great skier. So there are lots and lots of options like that. It does take planning and it takes uh, making sure that there's an instructor who can work with him. Um, you know, we're fortunate to be able to stay with friends in Colorado who have plenty of space where they live for Jeff and the accessible bathroom. But that's not the case everywhere. You've got to do extra planning in order to make it happen. We don't want Jeffrey to ever think that his life is circumscribed in any way because of his ability, but we know that there are some things that are just harder, so we try to work our way around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think there could also be a lot more information out there, especially in regards to traveling for people with disabilities, where things that seem harder could be a lot easier with the kind of resources that are out there that people don't know about. 
I agree. So I know that Jeff insisted on living on his own, as you, you were telling us as earlier as well, and you now found a place in Westminster, Maryland, right? Um, right. That had the necessary accommodations that enabled him to live independently. So does he have a family of his own? Um, if not, is he interested in getting married and having a family of his own? Um, and the last part of this question is, how can physical and attitudinal barriers change for the better to enable people like Jeff to live the life that he wants to live e either with or without a, a, a family of, uh, of his own, even with the, you know, the disabilities, the challenges that comes with having spina bifida? Well, Jeff, um, you're right. A lot of challenges with spina bifida, and then you couple that with the physical uh, challenges that came after the injury when he was 16. Um, Jeffrey does not have a, another a family of his own. I mean, we are his family. Um, he lives in a group home, and I would say um, Jeffrey Jeffrey's friends matter very much to him. He's a very social person. He loves to stay in touch. He is 38 years old. He is still single. Um, I don't know what his plans are for the future. Uh, I, think, I think it's clear, you know, that it's tougher for, for individuals with disabilities to think about how they uh, might have a family of their own, but there's no reason why that should be. Um, and uh, I, I hope that Jeffrey knows, I, I believe he knows, that we are absolutely supportive should he decide you know, to, uh, to have a family of his own, to uh, you know, have a partner, have married and so forth. So I think that's, that's really his decision. Um, but I know that it's complicated. I know that um, when an individual has a significant number of ability issues, um, that's gonna be part of life for the duration of his life. And so that has to come into play. Um, but I think, you know, what we've tried to do is say to him, anything that we can do to make your life as full of possibility as possible, as we can, you know, to make it possible for you to be with friends, to see friends, um, we, we absolutely want to do this. During the pandemic, you can imagine it's extremely challenging. Uh, they haven't left the house and I think over a month now because they just can't, they go outside to get some fresh air in the yard around the house, but and maybe walk across the street to walk around a little, but uh, take a little stroll. But um, there's not much more than that. Everything is, we've been having family Zoom uh, conferences with uh, cousins and aunts and uncles, and that's been a lot of fun. And even with our family, with Jeff. So that's been great. Um, but, you know, you're right about having, having a family of your own is something that, you know, every adult at least thinks about. And, um, and I, I hope Jeffrey, you know, knows that whatever he decides to do, we would absolutely be supportive of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, just perhaps this next question may be a little repetitive just because there's a lot of um, similarity. Um, how has the physical and attitudinal barriers experienced by people with disabilities of our current time shaped what is possible and impossible for your son, Jeffrey? If relevant, what radical social change uh, needs to happen in order for individuals with spina bifida like your son to reach their full potential, knowing the challenges that are in existence. For example, as you know, um, disability advocate Judy Human, when she was growing up, a lot of the buildings did not have ramps or elevators and, right. and uh, a lot of sidewalks did not have curb cuts. And so people with disabilities had to go out there and protest. And of course, Judy did a lot of the mo mobilization and uh, organizing of that to make right. that happen. So what similar drastic changes need to occur for people like your son to succeed in this society and reach his highest human potential? Well, Judy is a, is a hero. I mean, I don't know if she likes my using that word, but she is a, has set an example for so many individuals with disabilities because she has been courageous, she's been outspoken, she's really 
she's been a, a beacon, if you will, for uh, the cause of those with disabilities. So I'm, I'm hugely um, in awe of Judy and everything she's done. Um, I would say that as the mother of a son with disabilities that we need to do a much better job as a society recognizing that people with disabilities are just like us. They have hopes, dreams, and aspirations. They want an education. They want friends. They want a family. They want loved ones. They want, they want to be able to travel. They want to be able to experience life to the fullest um, to the extent of their uh, possibility, of their ability. And so we need to make it possible for them. They shouldn't have be held back in any way because of what's happened to them. And I certainly feel that way about Jeff, our son. Um, I think we still, frankly, for all the advances that have been made because of the ADA, which we celebrate, there still are too many places that are not open and not accessible, to people with disabilities. Um, and I hope that as time goes by, uh, and it's not very much time, um, we've been waiting a long time. I mean, in Jeff's case, it was 21 years ago. Um, that he was injured, uh, going on 22. So I, you know, we've waited a long time and I want to see the United States continue to be the leader on some of these issues. Um, it took a long time for the U.S. to pass the ADA. Uh, there's so many countries around the world, as I'm sure you know, that don't even do, don't even offer the accommodations that we offer in the U.S. Um, and that needs to happen. I mean, it needs to be the case for individuals around the world. But in this country, we still need to do a better job in terms of, uh, of having uh, vocations, jobs that are open to people with disabilities, having social services open to them, physical barriers need to come down, um, and attitudes need to change. People need to recognize, as I said a moment ago, that people with disabilities are just like us. They just happen to have different abilities, that's all. Um, they want you know, they want to have a full life, they want to contribute, they want to make a difference in the world, um, and there's no really no reason why they shouldn't be able to do that to the extent of their abilities. So uh, we've come a long way, but we still, in my view, have a very long way to go, and it's a battle we have to keep fighting, and that's why we need, we need folks like uh, Judy Human and, and the many others who have, who have been pioneers and have um, frankly, trailblazers in this arena. I view my own son, Jeff, as a great, um, uh, as, as making his own contributions because when people see him, they see what he's trying to do um, and, and, and the many friends that he's made where he lives in Westminster, Maryland, as part of the Target Community and Educational Services Program. So um, I just think, I think we have to keep fighting the good fight. Yeah, exactly. So after vicariously experiencing uh, the challenges that the disability community faces through your son's disability, um, what specific changes do you want to see happen, um, especially those with sp uh, spina bifida, which is your you know, closest uh, experience? What is an ideal world for someone with spina bifida like your son? And I know that in that earlier question, just so that you don't have to be rep repetitive and repeat, is you, you were alluding to that there are lots of changes that should be made and need to be made. Um, can you answer the question in, under, in the framework of how it has, how the lack of opportunities in our society in the U.S. has limited um, Jeffrey's um, outlook and opportunities? People who have spina bifida, who are born with spina bifida, hydrocephalus, often have learning differences in addition to physical limitations. And I just think our society needs to do a much better job of reducing those barriers, of making um, physical spaces more accessible, certainly making educational opportunities more open, more, more accommodating. I know when Jeffrey, even well before he was injured at the age of 16, every year at school, I had to work with the teachers to um, make sure they understood that Jeff was, you know, very strong in this kind of learning, but he needed a little support in that kind of learning. Very, very smart young man, very smart student, but he needed some, some, uh, some help with getting, with test taking, 
a little more time sometimes with tests, a um, little more time with some kinds of work projects. And so um, I think we need to do a better job with, with students with spina bifida, with, with these challenges in schools. I think educational systems need to do a better job. And um, I, I would say to me, that's the main thing in addition to physical uh, opportunities. Uh, obviously, I think you know, there should be um, uh, the availability of medical and health um, treatments for people with spina bifida, uh, hydrocephalus, uh, that, that we were able to enjoy. And I know they've, been, they've made many uh, scientific and medical advances since Jeffrey was born. They're able to, to do repairs in utero, for example, uh, on babies who are, who, uh, or I should say, um, when the fetus is, when it's realized that the fetus may have spina bifida. So we're so thankful for all that. Um, and we just need to continue to support that kind of research and that kind of um, medical scientific advancement in our country. So a lot of work to be done. Um, and the more we get the word out, the better it is. Thank you so much for, for bringing such awareness to uh, disabilities, especially spina bifida. I know that several movies have been made recently about spina bifida. Um, and uh, people certainly know more about it than before. So also, I know you have to go, but thank you for being generous and, yeah. and being willing to participate on, in our podcast show. And um, good luck with your interviews. Thank you so much, Ming. Nice to meet you and all the best. Did you like this video? If so, share with your friends and be sure to follow us on social media. And if you want even more resources, be sure to sign up for our email updates on our website, traipsingglobal.com. Keep learning new perspectives, keep being inclusive because it will make the world a better place for you and for everyone else. Thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you on another episode of the Traipsing Global on Wheels podcast hour.